morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, apologies for the late start, but we've all been stuck in traffic and trains and what have you. Um, have you been watching the health and safety moment from the Jill Sock? Is that a yes? yes. OK, so a few housekeeping rules today. Um, is he going to put my slides up yet? No? OK. Welcome. <laughs> Here we go. It's basically in a, sorry, in a uh, air stewardess. If you're this side, go out that door through the main doors. If you're that side, go through that one through the curtain. <coughs> and the muster point is in the big square in the Royal Society of Arts. Um, bit usually by the statue. No fire drills planned today, so if it goes off, it's real, okay? And off we go. Okay. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So thank you for coming. This is um, the first uh, contaminated land forum that we've had for London, uh, North East Thames, as, as it used to be since 2017. Um, but thanks to the contaminated land group from the Jill Sock, we've managed to secure coming here for half a day, and we're hoping to make it an annual event. Um, I want to discuss a bit later on at the end about how we take it forward. Um, but thank you for ACOM for <laughs> supporting all the refreshments. So uh, all the lectures, um, presentations, and the audio has been recorded today. Is any, if anyone's got any issues, have been recorded. Um, come and see me later. Obviously, because it is recorded, please watch your language. Um, <laughs> polite reminder. So I've just gone through the the fire drills. Um, so yeah, so the, the, the agenda, we're, sorry for starting late, but we're going to just start off with a quick EA update and any hot topics um, that we're aware of, and then I'll hand over to Alex Sani from Jillsock to talk about the chartership, Hugh to talk about NQMS and Silk and SQP, and then Chris Taylor from National Grid to talk about the NQMS, and then we'll have a quick refreshments before we kick off again, okay? So I'm Theresa Corey, I'm one of the groundwater and technical specialists uh, for contaminated land in uh, the Hearts of North London area for the Environment Agency. So our geolog uh, geological patch, our patch, is basically roughly the northern half of the N25 plus two or three junctions of the major motorways out um, down to the north bank of the River Thames. And then we hand over to our West Thames colleagues, our oh, sorry, called Thames, and... Um, Beds and Cams and Essex and Kent and South London. So, a lot of people were talking about, or oh, there was a bit of chatter on Dismal just before Christmas about the land contamination, um, the sort of the rewrite of CRR 11. So, Angela Haslam has asked me to thank you to everybody who took the time to, to make comments. We're always open to having comments, so even when the new version comes up, please. If something's, you know, if you've got a burning issue with something, please do email in and let us know. So the Environment Agency are currently addressing all the comments, and the first thing that will be amended apparently is the options appraisal matrix, and it'll be updated throughout this year. Um, we cannot publish this as a PDF, but other formats are being investigated so that things can be printed and saved as a PDF required. 
as I say, we're, we're trying to get the main sort of bulk of the uh, CR11 on, on the web as HTML by the end of Jan, but as you know, um, IT publishing has its own timescales, probably geological. Um, okay, <laughs> phew, sorry, did I just say that out loud? Um, okay, so as you know, CR11 is actually formally withdrawn, but obviously great source of information and um, you know, the, those flowcharts are, are still sort of as valid as they ever were, really, because they're sort of best practice. And there's a link to the pages. Um, PFOS, PFAS, PFOA, all hitting the headlines at the moment. Um, there's a new film called Dark Waters coming out, all about DuPont in uh, America. Um, this, we, we, were at, um, we were present at the Syria, uh, who cares about PFAS, POS, um, conference last year and uh, the agency are taking an interest in it so hot off the press I guess um, we've managed to secure some funding to do a phase one study in looking at known sources or trying to identify sources of PFOS, PFAS, PFOA in the UK and then we'll start sort of building on our um, risk screening concepts and how to deal with it from that point onwards. But as a, as, a, as, as a quick thing that's happened is before our groundwater sustainable places planning matrix consultation, internal consultation matrix did not include firefighting and training facility sites and now it does. So um, where we know we've got big industrial estates where they've done fire training activities and there may be a risk of PFOS in the firefighting foams releasing to ground, that, that now should fall under our attention. So um, our land quality capitals manager, Michael Hughes, is project managing the phase one study and at the moment they're still going through the procurement process of, of uh, getting consultant in and we're hoping that they'll complete the work by the end of year. Um, financial end in, in end of March. Um, <clears throat> don't know how many of you are aware, but the R and D M and A guidance that was um, that we all know and love back in early two thousands. That's actually been withdrawn and it's on archive. Um, when working, we're, we're sort of in a little steering group involved with Claire to update the existing M and A guidance. Um, so I guess the the final product will probably look a little bit like the how to do DQRA for TPH. Um, so it won't have an EA badge on it per se, but we are going, we are involved in the whole process. So at the moment, they're still doing the initial review. It's been undertaken by a small group of professionals, and then it will go down to the Claire Wider TIE group to uh, to for consultation. <coughs> uh, elsewhere. Um, the agency waste team are looking at quality protocols. I've put this in here because um, there's a lot of we, we've come up, uh, sort of come up across the importation criteria of topsoils or subsoils on sites as part of the remedial strategies and verification plans. And actually, what seems to be happening is that their uh, developers are importing material potentially being brought in from sites manufacturing soils. Um, if they're actually produced from waste, then technically they're still waste. There is an exemption that you can use to import such material, but they're probably being imported in quantities more than that. But as a side, all the wrap QPs are uh, being reviewed by e b Waste. So the first ones are compost, anaerobic digester, and poultry litter ash. Um, but that will, in, you know, this this will also include the stuff like secondary aggregates, as well. So it's just sort of keep your eye out, for, um, I guess, to just liaise with your waste colleagues um, to find out about those QPs. Okay, uh, this is a, a quick one for EU exit tomorrow. So I've put here keep calm. It's business as usual. So as far as the environmental laws are concerned. Um, they're still in place until the UK amend uh, or um, decide to pull out completely. But they've got defer effect, so they've got to rewrite the legislation. Um, so until they do, everything is still the same. So it's just business as usual. And on that note, I would like to end with Happy New Year, because it's Chinese New Year at the moment.
Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to hand over to Alex. Um, we'll do a few questions after Alex's, and if you could hold the SQP and, and the Sobra ones until after Chris's, uh, before we go into interval, that would be good. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for the invite for uh, Sean and I to talk today. Sean is unfortunately, well, fortunately for him, just returned from the Maldives, so I'm doing the presentation. Before I start, I wanted to mention that we have library tours running today, so if every, anyone would like to see our library and map room after this morning, you're welcome to. If you can't make it today, there's going to be a sign-up sheet on the registration desk to register for um, the tours in the future. So my name's Alex and I look after Chartership on behalf of the Society. I work very closely with our Chartership Officer, Sean Richardson, and our Vice President of Chartership, who is currently John Talbot. So just a bit of background, JOLSOC was uh, formed in 1807. It is the oldest geological society in the world. Um, this was Society receives the Royal Charter in 1825, and under this charter, we can award the Chartered Geologist status. We are also licensed by the Science Council to award the Chartered Scientist status. So, um, if there's any non-members in the room, we have a range of membership benefits. I'm also going to leave some leaflets on the registration desk with our 2020 benefits. Um, but a quick overview here, uh, the key benefit that we're seeing for professional members at the moment is the route to chartership that we offer. So why should people become chartered? Now there's various reasons, however the key one is it is the recognition of your professional activities and the assessment of your competencies through a peer review process. Once you've become chartered, you can join a range of um, specialist post-chartership registration lists, such as ROGEP, SILK, I think there's one more, but I can't remember it off the top of my head. There are four routes to chartership that we currently offer. So we offer a normal route, and that's for applicants with under 20 years' experience. So we offer chartered geologist status and chartered scientist status. They're a little bit different in how they're assessed, but I'll discuss that in a moment. And the 20 year, if you have more than 20 years experience, we offer chartered geologist and chartered scientist, but there's a more streamlined application process. Um, the main difference with the 20 plus route at the moment is that we don't ask for supporting documents. This might change in the future. So if you are looking to apply through the 20 plus route and would like a more streamlined process, please do think about applying in the near future. So the application process, the first thing you need to decide is whether you would like to apply for chartered geologist status or chartered scientist status. You need to be a fellow of the Geological Society. We previously had a rule that you had to be a fellow for more than three months, however, our new system means that you can apply for fellowship and apply for chartership at the same, same time. Um, you need to check whether you're ready for chartership. We have a form on the website which lists all the comp competencies and you can mark off, self-assess yourself against this form. Uh, you need to be competent in all seven criteria for chartered geologists and all five criteria for chartered scientists and you need to have two sponsors. Now, I think hopefully for Contaminated Land Group, knowing that we have quite a lot of um, chartered people in the sector, people shouldn't have too many difficulties finding two sponsors who are chartered. However, we have some flexibility with this, and if you contact me before your application to state that you're having difficulties finding one sponsor, we have some mechanisms we can employ uh, before you submit your application, which would um, mean we're not turning people around full chartership. We know that people who are working in small companies 
often do struggle to find two chartered uh, sponsors. Um, so you then submit the application. We have step-by-step -step guidelines on our website. Um, the application comes in to me. I will do an initial assessment on the application and between Sean and I, we will then select two scrutineers um, who review the documentation. At this stage, the, there are three options available for us. We either will come back to you and say we need more information to support your application going to interview. We will postpone your interview with if there are significant changes that need to be made to the application. And a postponement means that it gives you a chance to resubmit without making an additional payment. Or we will proceed to interview, which happens in the majority of cases. So the application itself consists of the application form, AD1, a professional report for normal routes, or a career account for the 20 plus route, CPD records. I'm going to talk a bit more about CPD um, because it's one of the areas that we are regularly going back to people to say they need to improve on. Two sponsors reports. Uh, sorry, with CPD, we need three full years of CPD records as well. Um, I think a couple of years ago it used to only just be one, but now it's three. And if you're applying through the normal route, we need six supporting documents, up to six supporting documents. These supporting documents are not currently required for the 20 plus route. As part of the application process, we ask everyone to prepare a short 15 minute uh, presentation for interview. Uh, scrutineers do this a little bit differently. Some people like you to give your presentation as a 15 minute slot. Others like you to start presenting and then they will ask you questions so your entire hour and a half interview could be based on the presentation and surrounding questions. So the criteria for chartered geologists, we have seven. The first one is understanding the complexities of geolo geology and geological processes in space and time. Second one is evaluation of geoscience information to generate predictive models. Third one is effective uh, communication. And the seventh one is competence in area of expertise. Now, just two notes on this. One, one we are assessing you, or you are being assessed, on your competence as a geologist, not your competence to do your day job. So we really want you to pull out your geological aspects in the application and in the interview, please. The second one is when you fill in the application form, you'll see that you will be able to state your area of expertise. This is now a free text box on the form. And we're finding, the reason we've done that is because we, we understand that geoscience is changing. Um, we have different areas of geoscience coming to light. Uh, when you are selecting your area of expertise, my advice would be to keep it to one or two areas only. This is because every area of expertise you write down on the form, you will be assessed as being competent in it. So if you write down six areas of expertise, as I had in the last round, you may have expertise in six areas, but it's unlikely your scrutineers are going to say you are competent in every single area of those expertise. So please choose the one that you feel most confident and most confident in. And you will be chartered in that area of expertise. The second lot of criteria we have are competency in HSE and environmental issues, uh, professionalism and the code of conduct, which is on our website, and CPD planning and recording, which we assess through your CPD records. Uh, chartered scientists' competency competencies are different, they are A to E. So we have the application of knowledge and understanding, the use of scientific method, uh, personal responsibility, which is again covers HSC, working autonomously, leadership roles, interpersonal skills, professional practice, and professionalism, which again covers the code of conduct and CPD records. We have the option 
for you to simultaneously apply for chartered geologist and chartered scientist status. However, this uh, means you're filling in two sets of forms at once. You do have to fill in both sets of forms. We also have the option for you to apply retrospectively for one or the other. And you can do that within two years without going through a second interview. It's completely up to you how you do it. However, most people at the moment are finding the retrospective application is a slightly easier, easier way to do it. So sponsors. We expect your sponsors to write two supporting um, statements for you. They fill in uh, a sponsor's form, which we have online. They must have known you and your work for three years. And as I said earlier, we like them to be chartered. However, we have some flexibility with that. We can accept if you uh, propose it to us before you submit your application, uh, people who are chartered from other organizations. And we are currently have some applications where we are saying that we can have one chartered person and one fellow of the JOLSOC to support applications. OK, CPD. So hopefully, if you're planning to become chartered soon, you have been maintaining CPD records. It's a mandatory requirement for your application. We have to see the last three year records. And it is also mandatory to maintain your chartered status each year. We have several options for CPD records. We have, well, I'm a bit hesitant to mention it at the moment, if you've seen our social media messages around this, an online portal. Um, if you haven't got 2020 CPD and you have paid your 2020 fees, uh, you should be receiving the 2020 tab very shortly. We also have on the website the 2017 uh, Word document table, which you can fill in, which we accept. And we also accept CPD records from company schemes as well, as we appreciate a lot of you will keep your records as part of your corporate professional development. So there's a range of hours um, for different people and different experiences. To apply for chartership, if you're in full-time employment, you need to be providing us with 90 hours um, a year, and 30 of those hours need to be on the job training. When I get an application, the first thing I do is check there are more than 90 hours for each year, and that 30 of those are on the job, and it is usually the point where we go back to candidates and say, please, can you update your CPD records? Um, for any year, if you have been on paternity leave, carer's leave, we can drop the hours, that's fine. If you're retired and not offering any services, then we don't expect you to maintain CPD records. So we have, this is on our website, I'm not going to talk through it all because it's kind of bitty. <laughs> but I just wanted to demonstrate that people often say to me, I can't do CPD because I don't have the option to do it without realising just how many areas of um, CPD activities we accept. We accept way more than is on, than is on this list. Um, uh, but yeah, an example of all kind of things that can add to CPD mind map. Reading your geoscientist, if you're a fellow and you get it every month, goes towards CPD. So we have six categories, professional practice, self-directed study, on-the-job training, formal learning, informal learning, and other. On the job must be 30%, which is 30 hours. And I was going to say something else. Just forgot. Sorry, mind blank. Um, the, oh yes, the other 60 hours must come from at least two of the other categories. So our CPD is hours-based, uh, it has to be developmentally focused. Um, as I said earlier, we accept CPD, uh, corporate CPD, as long as we can see that there's 30 hours in on-the-job training and 90 hours in total, plus a plan and reflection every year. <coughs> okay, supporting documents. This is the kind of second key pitfall we're experiencing at the moment. We ask for up to six um, carefully selected supporting documents. 
These do not have to be company reports. And I have to say that because um, a lot of people think that we, we, we only accept company reports. To be honest, company reports are very difficult to assess. We are in assessing you as an individual. And when we get a company report, it's often been seen, changed, edited by several people. And you may not be the lead author on it. So what we are suggesting now is that you, if you've done a company report, you can take the bits of geology in that that you've done and uh, recreate a smaller report for your scrutineers to assess your ge geological competency. If you have um, reports that are confidential, we do uh, offer, they go to your scrutineers, but we can do a confidentiality agreement. Really good things we'd like to see are cross-sections, ground models, maps and diagrams, um, and interpretations of how you've used, for instance, your health and safety policy. Have you ever had to make a, a challenge on a health and safety point? How did you document that? Um, <coughs> we ask for supporting documents to be in colour where possible, and they have to be legible for the scrutineers. Please don't submit supporting documents that are 200 pages in length because your scrutineers are volunteers and they don't have the time to read it. Um, so onto the interview process. So two scrutineers assess each candidate against the seven or five competencies based on the application documents. Um, Scrutineers at the interview, if you go to interview, they will then make an assessment on, a recommendation, sorry, on whether to accept the application or defer the application. In the very unlikely event that you are deferred, your um, application and assessment forms will be further assessed by two experienced scrutineers. Uh, we then, as a team, will sit, sit down if there's any disagreements and um, make a decision on how to go forward. But it usually goes to our vice president of chartership, who will uh, then follow up with the candidate with the decision. When we defer an application, we always give constructive feedback and the candidates can reassess, reapply in the future. So what next? If you're not a fellow, please do apply for fellowship. If you would like to apply for chartership, which I hope lots of you do want to, um, please look at the website. Please contact me, there's details coming. Uh, put together your professional portfolio for CPD. For those of you who are sitting here who may not have known about chartership and haven't kept CPD records in uh, for the proposed amount of time, the some of the tips I've heard of how people do it is Outlook calendars. They go through their meetings, um, personal diaries, and emails. Um, and then they construct their CPD records. Um, if you want to, you can apply for CSI or CJOL retrospectively within <coughs> two years. And then you can look at the other qualifications that you are eligible to apply for post-chartership. So we have recently set up a LinkedIn group for mentoring. And uh, this is uh, open to everyone internationally. We have around 180 mentors in there at the moment. Uh, the idea is that you, if you want to apply, you write a short post outlining your background, uh, what stage of the application you are in, and where you are, and whether you would like video mentoring or face-to-face um, -face mentoring. I can give this link to Teresa to circulate to the group if that would be helpful. Um, so our website has lots of information, but if you have any specific questions that you don't want to ask me now, um, the email is chartership at jolsoc.org.uk. I'm happy to take questions now. I'm happy to come down to the refreshments and mingle, and I'll be in the foyer after you guys have finished for the day if anyone else wants to ask me anything. Any questions? Thank you very much.
to you. Loading. It's just loading. Right. Okay. It's on my screen. Hey. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I am a chartered geologist, and um, one of the things I'd like to say is if you are a geologist, please consider getting chartered. Um, I know a lot of people say, why should I bother? But if you are in this business, then surely you want to demonstrate your professionalism and what better way than chartership. Having been a scrutineer for a number of years, contaminated land people, if you're a contaminated land specialist, then becoming chartered geologist is pretty tricky because you will get tested on that category number one about geological time and space. So look at chartered scientists unless you can really be confident about your ability to look at 3D models and um, time and space. So maybe hydrogeologists um, in contaminated land, yeah, you stand a good chance. But people who spend all their time, like me now, digging in May ground and perhaps getting down as far as the London clay, um, you know, <laughs> it's not... Geologically, it's not challenging. So anyway, um, irrespective of all of that, please, please do consider chartership because it is an absolutely um, fundamental part of what uh, Chris and I are going to talk about, which is about uh, competence. And the National Quality Mark Scheme, which is what I've um, uh, been asked to talk about, so the National Quality Mark Scheme was um, set up by a group called the Land Forum. Um, at the time, the Land Forum is comprised of public and private sector organisations, industry, land owners, consultants, regulators and government. Um, it's since moved on to become called the National Brownfield Forum. Um, and I think the minutes are, I get to see the minutes every so often, it's worth looking at the minutes from that every so often. And if you then have an MP, you could complain to your MP, why is government absent from the National Brownfield Forum? Because nobody from um, government departments ever attend those meetings, as far as I can see. Um, so anyway, or if you've got somebody who you know at Land Forum, get them to encourage DEFRA and CLG to, um, to go along. Anyway, <clears throat> the Land Forum um, was set up with two main aims. One was to take this strategic overview about contaminated land issues and redevelopment, but also to promote sustainable use of land. Um, all too often when we talk about sustainability, the, the, the conversation just degenerates into discussions about energy, and that's the only thing people ever talk about. Whereas actually, particularly in a country like the UK, land surely is one of the most fundamental resources we have. And therefore what we all do in contaminated land, I think, is an absolutely um, epitome of how what sustainable development is all about. Um, so the, the Land Forum, when it looked at how does it go about achieving these aims, thought they could develop this system, the National Quality Mark Scheme. And it was part of the Better Regulation Initiative, which is um, three words I absolutely hate um, because they come from that awful um, uh, period of, of our country when David Cameron decided that um, actually the way forward uh, was to rip up all regulations and just let industry get on with things um, and call better regulation. Um, caused a lot of problems, but one of the things that National Quality Mark Scheme was aiming to do was to actually improve the quality of the reports that we as consultants produce so that you as regulators, when you get reports in front of you, don't just tear your hair out and go, God, what is this load of crap? Um, you know, how are people still producing reports like this? Um, and this, this um, realisation came about because all too often... Um, you know, reports are not up to standard. Why is that? Well, because developers, many developers, do not get your ACOMs to produce the report for you. They get Humala Inc., who has never done any CPD in his life and just produces a report for £5 because the developer will give him £5 to do it. Um, not surprisingly, those sorts of £5 reports are not really worth the paper they're written on, and they cause untold grief for the regulators. Um, so the National Quality Mark Scheme is, was, and should play um, an increasingly significant role in um, the progress of our reports from where they were to where we hope they'll be in the future. And 
so yeah, I've said what the NQMS was designed to do, but the really important thing is actually every single report that we as consultants prepare or that you as regulators get to see can be covered by the National Quality Mark Scheme. So it does everything, it can do everything associated with due diligence studies, death studies, right the way through to verification reports. So every report we, we do could be um, part of the National Quality Mark Scheme. Because what it ends up doing is saying, when you've done something that's in line with the National Quality Mark Scheme, this report has been carried out with good practice, and it's been signed off by a suitably qualified and experienced person, an SQP, someone competent to sign off that report. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? The real big challenge then is, how do we get people to um, buy into this? And the first and probably one of the most important elements is support from the Environment Agency. And I don't know if they did go up to the mountain, but they ended up with 10 um, things that they think the agency will do as a result of the National Quality Mark Scheme. And I'm not going to go through all of them here for you. They're on the EA website. But you can see that what the agency is saying are there's a couple of really important things. One is that they encourage local planning authorities to reference the ANQMS in their standing advice. Now, I'm going to come back to this over and over. If every single local planning authority said, we will take account of reports submitted under the NQMS, developers will then be faced by consultants, people like me, saying, if we do it under an NQMS scheme, it's going to cost you a bit more to do it, but here's the advantage. This is what will happen. So this is a real big deal, I think. The agency said that any work it carries out will be subject to the NQMS, um, and it encourages uh, um, uh, operators, developers, to use the NQMS, and any pollution incidents will be managed under the National Quality Mark Scheme and enforcement activities. This is quite, I like number 10, where NQMS conclude that pollution is prevented or managed satisfactorily, the agency will conclude no further regulatory intervention or enforcement is necessary. That's quite a big gain. So have a look at these um, aims. If you're a local authority person, please go back to your authorities and see why aren't we including reference to the NQMS in our policies? If you're a consultant, think about next time you're faced with that uh, developer who doesn't want to pay you more than five pounds to do a report, say, well, what about if we do a report under the National Quality Mark Scheme? Yeah, it's going to cost you 10 pounds, but... What's the government said about it? Well, actually, I was trying to find out exactly about this yesterday, and I talked to Nicola Harries at Clare to make sure that I was... Um, talking the right sort of thing and just so that she's aware of what's being said. And she, I misunderstood what she told me because she said, oh, the MPPF now has a really good reference to National Quality Mark Scheme. Well, okay, I missed that. So I went back, got out the 2019 version of MPPF and no, it doesn't. It's completely wishy-washy, mamby-pamby language that doesn't say anything about the National Quality Mark Scheme or competent people, really. But what does happen is in the gov.uk land contamination policy statement, which was last updated in June last year, that has got some very helpful um, comments, um, which talks about the reports that you produce and that suitably qualified people must produce them. And it does then say you can use the National Quality Mark Scheme, a voluntary scheme set up by the National um, Brownfield Forum, and a suitably qualified person will check your land contamination reports. Now, what would be great would be if they actually said, rather than you can, I mean, yeah, you can, you can eat less, you can exercise more, you can, you can do all sorts of things, but do you need to do them? You need a doctor to say, you do need to eat less, you do need to exercise more. We need the regulators, we need the government to say, you do need to use the National Quality Mark Scheme, you do need to use, need to use competent persons to sign them off. OK, we're not going to get there, I understand that, but stronger language would be better, but this is a real good thing. If the developer says to you, why do we need to do this, this is why. You can say, look what we can do. We can say we comply with national policy. 
So what does National Quality Mark Scheme aim to do? It provides a quality to mark which aims to give assurance that land contamination issues are addressed adequately and will be properly managed. They should help regulators make decisions by get sub getting submissions right first time. Now, wouldn't that be great? Just imagine the savings, the efficiencies, the benefit to our mental health if we all wrote reports that were satisfied the regulator at first time. And for the regulators, they got a report and they said, I don't need to go back and say, please, can you provide the evidence? Because it is all here. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it? It really would. So the increased efficiency, yeah, OK, so here's a better regulation thing. It would result in savings, both in public and private sectors, as well as our mental health, I think. Um, and what it then should do, it should allow the regulators to deal with those real problem sites, either the very difficult sites or the ones which are being dealt with by Humana Inc. and has produced a £5 report. <coughs> So how does it work? Um, yeah, as I said, it was set up by this National Brown Forum, Brownfield Forum, um, a cross-industry, pan-industry um, body. Um, and part of their role, this is just one part of it, was set up the National Quality Mark Steering Group, which still sits there. Um, and that is then um, split into two parts, how the actual thing works. Um, the administrator is Claire uh, the organisation Claire, and they um, uh, they look after the admin side of things, and then Silk provides the suitably qualified persons, and I'll just talk about that briefly. So Claire, they are responsible for maintaining the National Quality Mark website. So have a look at that. They've got frequently asked questions, and they manage the online declaration system. They have access to the register of suitably qualified persons, and they will manage the auditing of a complaints um, procedure, um, and they record declarations. So have a look on their website, which I've listed there. And then how do you get, the, um, how do you get to be a suitably qualified person? You can only become a suitably qualified person um, via the silk register. So the Silk Register is an organisation which processes applicants for the role of suitably qualified persons and administers the application and exam process. Um, suitably qualified persons, so this is an individual. You can't say, ACOM, we're an SQP company. You are not. You're a company who employ SQPs. So it goes with the person, and an SQP is a person who implements the requirements of the National Quality Mark Scheme, and it is they and they alone who can put the quality mark on a report. <clears throat> so you can become a suitably qualified person by two routes. Um, so first of all, you have to be chartered. That, that's a, a, a given. Then if you are already a silk, so if any of you out there are already a silk, you can become a suitably qualified person just by completing an online um, training package and an online exam. And then once you've done that, you can become a silk. More and more now, most of the existing silks who wanted to become SQPs have done that, and so they are on the SQP register. People who are going to become silks, then this is what you will do in the future. You will automatically be eligible for becoming a suitably qualified person if you pass the silk registration process because part of the silk um, exam and registration is doing the SQP online course. It also means you will, you will probably get tested in your interview about what the National Quality Mark Scheme means and what um, being an SQP means. Um, so the fundamental role of the SQP is to ensure that the report that we produce is a quality product and we ensure, this is a real big deal, that it has been produced by competent people. <clears throat> so, yeah, to be an SQP, you have to be chart chartered, bound by a professional code of conduct. I would say this is one of the most important reasons for becoming chartered, because you are then bound by a code of conduct. That is so, so helpful to you as a professional person. Um, I know people think it's, it's, it's just paper that's written there. It is not. It helps you in every single aspect of your professional life, the code of conduct. 
Um, some good bits in here about people who are eligible. You have to have sufficient experience to have a good overview. So this comes back to the person who put down six competencies on their, on their application. It is absolutely impossible to be competent in six areas of, of um, or have six specialism in, in the geological sciences, I think. I really, really, really struggle to... I struggle to keep up with my one, which I claim. Um, I really do. I think you need to be capable of recognising your own limitations, and that's a real big deal, and I can talk about that a bit more if we've got a moment later. Um, recognise your own limitations, identify the specialist skills of other, um, be aware of the requirements of all the regulatory regimes. So if you're producing a report in Northern Ireland... It is a different regulatory regime. It is no good referring to the UK guidance there. You've got to look and be sure that you know what's going on in the country you're um, working on. And then, yeah, committed to maintaining CPD. And you heard a lot of that um, from Alex. Um, so what does the SQP need to do? Um, I'll go through this pretty quickly because I wanted to spend a bit more time on my penultimate slide. That the work's planned and undertaken by competent people, the data's collected correctly, that the uh, data is analysed and processed in line with good, um, good practice, that the report set out good conclusions, which are substantiated by the data and are based on reasonable interpretations, and any limitations or uncertainties are clearly identified. Now, that is something that we should do more of. Um, and what I wanted to do, I hope you can read this. Yeah, th so this is, the, this is a snapshot out of the declaration. So if you are an SQP and you're signing a declaration, this is what you're signing off. Now, it's worth just reading these out. The work has been carried out by appropriately capable people with reference to the Brownfield Skills Fair. So every single element of the work that's been carried out has been done by appropriately capable people that the work carried out is, to the best of my knowledge, undertaken with reasonable skill and care. It is not the best report that's ever been written anywhere in the world. Okay? It is just undertaken with reasonable skill and care. And the information and the data reported in it describe an appropriate scope and objectives. Every report should start off, this is the objectives, this is my scope of work. Accords with relevant good practice, the work's been carried out in accordance with the British standard and with, should be in every report, are based on appropriately robust science, are factually correct, i.e. you have not doctored the data, um, and has been appropriately reviewed. That all specialist aspects have been reviewed by an appropriately qualified, competent person with relevant skills and experience in that specialist area. <clears throat> now, recently I was involved in a very tricky piece of work and it, it was to do with a part 2A investigation so lots of people living on the site already. I was very worried about the work we were doing. I thought that we were really at the limits of the expertise of the team that we, we have in Bureau Hapold, we're a very small team. And so I then got somebody who I knew and trusted as a specialist in the area to review that particular element of our work. And that's then reported in, in the report. The benefits of that were huge. A, to us as a team, we learned a lot from, from this specialist. B, we felt much more confident in, in the report that went out. C, when we, got to the, when we got the report being published, and it was reviewed by Public Health England, by the Environment Agency, by the regulator, the fact that we'd had this peer review was really, really helpful, both to us and to them. So I don't think we do enough in our industry about peer review, but that's an important element that all specialist access have been reviewed by an appropriate specialist. Next one, that the interpretations and conclusions are reasonable. That does not mean that you have to agree with every word, every dot, every comma. That just that the conclusions and the interpretation is reasonable. Um, the proposals to mitigate actual potential or residual risks are appropriate. They don't have to be what you would do. They just have to be appropriate. And then finally, I am competent to sign this declaration because I am fully aware and comply with the Code of Conduct. So, sorry, this is my one. Um, so, hence the Code of Conduct of the Geological Society through which I hold chairship membership number 1443. The work of this review and declaration are within the limits of my knowledge, competence and professional capacity. 
Uh, I think those words are wonderful, and they should be really in every single report we write, whether or not um, it's been submitted under the National Quality Mark Scheme. So, current status of the scheme, it's voluntary. It is a voluntary scheme, it's not required, it, but it is simple. There's over 100 suitably qualified persons on the register at the moment, 75 declarations, so slow start, I think. Why, why is it so slow? Because we're not being forced to do it by the regulators. Um, there is government and environment agency support. Could it be stronger? Some local authorities are referring to the scheme and its policy, but I think the future is up to you, to, you, to us as consultants, to our fellow consultants, but also to you as the regulators. So I always do end up with seven um, conclusions, just so I can have your brother. It is The Magnificent Seven, the film. If you haven't seen it, please get it out, have a look at it on Netflix. Um, so it is a voluntary scheme, part of the Better Regulation Initiative. Um, it's something that's done really well, I think. Um, it recognised the need for improvement in our reports um, and the need for accredited competence. Um, the scheme is administered by Clare and the Silk Registers are provided by Silk. Um, it does not, it does not replace in any way the role of the regulator. The SQP cannot discharge a planning condition. That has to be the role of the local planning authority. So all that the SQP can do is say, here is my report, it complies with the NQMS, you can have confidence in it. And it is then down to the regulator to either agree or disagree and to sign off the, um, sign off the condition. First time right submissions should allow regulators um, more time for problematic sites, that would be really great. Um, and the National Quality Mark Scheme um, is designed and should play a significant role in, the, in improving quality in the future. I think it is down to us. Um, we've got two choices, I think. We either continue business as usual, finding fault with each other's work. What work. We love doing that, don't we? Oh, this regulator's a real pain in the ass. keeping asking me for this. This consultant doesn't know what they're doing. Look at this report. It's got a apostrophe missing. Or, you know, it does not matter. We could carry on like that and maybe we're all better off. Let's just do that. Or we can say, come on, we can make this industry work better. We can embrace the scheme and encourage its use um, and end up with better land quality assessment reports to the benefit of us. But it is down to us. So that's my um, evangelical end. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> He will be available for questions. <laughs> and introducing Chris Taylor. Just wait for that to load. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Chris Taylor from National Grid, here today representing Sobra. Uh, I've been asked to um, talk about the Sobra accreditation scheme and also touch on how that links into the National Quality Mark scheme as well. So, first of all, I'll start off with um, you know, what is Sobra? Who is Sobra? I, I don't know if everyone in the room has heard of the uh, Society of Brownfield Risk Assessment. It was essentially established um, as we recognised that there was um, a gap, and I wouldn't say the market, perhaps the sector, uh, where there was an opportunity to fill the knowledge gaps that we'd identified within the field of, of risk assessment. It was a society that was established to produce guidance for the sector, um, to represent risk assessors within the sector, and also to give us a profile and make sure that risk, risk assessment stays up there within everybody's minds within, within risk assessment and, and contaminated land. Um, we are 10 years old. We had our 10-year anniversary um, last year. It was at the, um, uh, just across the courtyard over at the Royal Society of Chemistry where we share an annual Christmas conference um, which was celebrated with 100 cupcakes, I think some with gin and tonic flavour and all sorts of wonderful things. Um, and um, it's, it's a society that holds 
Typically, we like to hold two conferences um, a year. We have a summer workshop on something quite techy, where we either delve into NAPL or vapor intrusion or lead or benzoapyrene and have a, a workshop. And we also have our Christmas conference where we talk about um, current issues in contaminated land. And we share that with the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, and we also have a bit of tox in there as well. We recently achieved our charity status, um, which is great if you want to claim the tax back from your subscription fees. And um, the entire society is run by volunteers. So what's in it for you? Why should you join Sober? What's it all about? Well, a lot of the hard work we do is through the subgroups that we support. Essentially, if there's something that's, that's burning in your, in your day job, that, oh, we haven't got enough information on landfill gas, let's say, you're welcome to come and approach us, um, pitch an idea for a subgroup with an objective of this is something that we'd like to find out more about, produce some guidance for the sector, and we can then provide some resources um, to try and get that supported. Currently, we've got um, subgroups in asbestos in soil, uh, vapour intrusion, NAPL, we're just about to set a one up in ground gases, um, and they do a lot of good work. Uh, the one we did on uh, producing some acute GACs uh, was very well received. There you can see our local celebrity. You can see Barry, who's sitting over here in the front row. Uh, we achieved um, a Brownfield Briefing Award, which was in the category for, was it best project from a non-for-profit organization? Uh, yes, very, very, very niche. I think we were against one other. Um, uh, but, uh, and that was for our um, acute gaps that we'd um, produced and, and published. The society is great because it gives you an opportunity to improve your, your technical knowledge by joining a subgroup, by attending our workshops, by reading our publications. We have bursary and scholarship schemes available. Um, so if you've got this idea in your head that, oh, can't do proper risk assessment without plant uptake, figures for carrots or something like that, and, you, and you're really, really keen that you, know, you want some, some, some data, come and speak to us. You know, there's an opportunity that we can help fund um, you know, some, some research that you'd like to do. Um, or you can ex uh, you know, receive uh, external recognition through our accreditation scheme, which I'll, I'll touch on shortly. And also we have a, a technical panel where um, members who've got our ASOBRA ac accreditation um, get an opportunity to feed into technical guidance. So, I've been asked to talk about our register of risk assessors and the accreditation scheme. So essentially, this was developed because, as risk assessors, there wasn't a way that you can demonstrate to your clients, to your employer, to your regulator, that you are a competent risk assessor. I mean, there wasn't anything out there. So this is a scheme that was developed so that you can do that. It's a standalone scheme. So it stands on its own two feet, and if you are a member of the scheme, you can demonstrate to your client and to your employer that you know what you were talking about. But more importantly, it's also been designed to be consistent with the National Quality Mark Scheme. So there are two tiers within the scheme that I'll touch on shortly. And the skills that, and, and the competencies that we require as part of our scheme align with the Brownfield Skills Framework, which is the basis for Silk and the basis for the SQP. So our R-SOBRA level is in line with level three of the Brownfield Skills Framework, and our A-SOBRA is in line with, with level four. And to be honest, when it comes to your development within your career, when it comes to your personal development plans, whether you're a regulator, whether you're an employer, whether you're an employee, um, and you want to develop your career, I, I'd advise that this is a great opportunity um, that you, know, you should be downloading the SOBRA um, skills framework, you should be downloading the Brownfield skills framework, and using the competencies and criteria in there for the basis for your own professional development. If you, if you want to progress your career and you need more experience of analyzing data and things like that to meet the, 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 the criteria of the SILK scheme and the SOBRA scheme, Use that as the basis for your, for your career. And you also end up with some fancy post-nominals and you get your name put onto a sober register. So I'll briefly touch on the scheme. As I said, it's, it's a two-tier scheme. Um, the R sober level are for those who are competent in undertaking um, or reviewing, because it was very important that we, we appreciated that quite often regulators don't actually go out there and do the risk assessments, but have to be competent 
in reviewing them. So you can either be someone who reviews them or, or undertakes them. And the OSOBRA scheme is aimed at those at the um, generic quantitative risk assessment level. And it's for those that can undertake GQRA without supervision. And then the ASOBRA is for more senior staff who either supervise those undertaking GQRAs and, uh, and would also be someone who's competent in undertaking detailed quantitative risk assessment. <laughs> we have four practice areas that we are able to um, accredit you in. They're currently within human health, controlled waters, gas and vapours, and you can apply for two of those at a time. When we started the scheme, we had it open to all four, which became extremely difficult and complicated to try and accredit somebody in all four practice areas at once, and um, we've now narrowed it down. So if you feel that um, you, you, you're quite competent or you feel that you are within human health and, and, and gas, for example, um, we'd advise that um, you, you spend your time um, focusing on those, if you, you can always then add additional competencies down the line. In terms of registration, um, there's some prerequisite um, requirements. Um, essentially, at the, at the RSOBRA level, we'd like you to be a member of a professional body, such as the Geological Society, the Institute of Environmental Science, for example. Um, that is desirable, but it's not essential. When it comes to the ASOBRA level, we, we do require you to have chartership. Um, there have been instances where we've been approached by people saying, oh, I've been doing risk assessment for 30 years. I haven't got chartered status because I can't be bothered. Um, so we've, we've decided that we would recognise that. There is, there is a form that you can fill in, and we, we can um, accredit you if you've got you know, many years' experience within the field but don't have chartership. But in that instance, we do require you to also have um, membership of a professional body which is essentially so that there's a code of conduct that Hugh mentioned earlier that you have to comply with. Um, so just a brief overview of the RSOBRA grade. Um, it's for people that are capable of undertaking or reviewing generic quantitative risk assessment. Uh, when it comes to something a bit more complicated, um, you would have to ask someone more senior for some, for some advice. And we're quite... Um, uh, satisfied that you would then meet the definition of a competent person under the MPPF for undertaking or reviewing GQRA. And we'd be happy that then you'd be able to sign off or approve um, a generic quantitative risk assessment under the National Quality Mark Scheme. Now we've been asked, oh, if I get my R-SOBRA or A-SOBRA, does that mean I'm, I'm an SQP? The answer for that is no, no, not at all. The only route that you can become an SQP at the moment is, is via silk. But if you are an SQP and now you are signing off a report and you are saying that either as the author of that report or someone who's reviewing it and signing it off, how do you know that the risk assessment element has been undertaken by a competent person? Well, if you as the SQP or if the person who undertook that risk assessment is part of the sober scheme, then you can have a high level of confidence that they know what they're talking about. And you can check that by looking on our online register. So um, what are the competencies that you need to become our sober? Now, there's a lot of text up there. I've grayed out most of it, because um, you can always go onto our website and have a look at it. But I'll just hi um, highlight the bits that I've highlighted in bold there. So there are, there are nine core criteria that you need to meet to be an R sobra. You need to understand death studies, how to undertake them, the data that you need to, um, to undertake them, and be able to undertake a preliminary risk assessment and design an initial conceptual site model. You need to understand the data that's required for your, 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 your risk assessment and the conceptual site model, and be able to check and analyze that data. You need to have um, familiarity with the various risk assessment models for GQRA and, of course, the ability to undertake that generic quantitative risk assessment. Once you've done that, you need to be able to make recommendations based on the outputs of that risk assessment and be able to communicate the risk to your client, to your, um, your regulator and to the public. And you need to have an awareness of all the other elements of risk assessment and the, how that interacts with the work that, that you've done. Uh, what we require is that you need to provide evidence on how you meet all of these criteria. If you meet eight out of nine, you don't, you don't meet the bar. So we're quite strict on that. In order for the society to accredit you, you need to provide evidence that you can meet competency in all nine of those areas. 
a brief overview of the ACE overgrade. Um, so that's someone who's got a more thorough understanding of land contamination risk assessment. Uh, you're likely to be more senior staff. Um, maybe you are someone that no longer undertakes the risk assessments, but you get the reports on your desk and you have to sign them off. Um, you could be someone who's the specialist in the team who does that dark art of detailed quantitative risk assessments and coming up with site-specific acceptance criteria and you know some tox and all the rest of it. Uh, you could be a senior regulator that has the ability to actually review a DQRA. I recall as being a, a regulator for over 10 years, I think I remember getting a DQRA across my desk once. And I think that was for my own part to a site, and that was the one I think that Barry wrote. Um, so um, you, you, di we don't, we, you didn't really get them that often. So it's very, very difficult if, if you don't see DQRAs as, as, as a regulator, or if you don't actually pr produce them, to actually have the expertise to be able to review them competently and, and, and sign them off. But getting this, this grade, this A sober grade, then we're satisfied that you, you would be able to sign them off under the National Quality Mark Scheme and meet that definition of a competent person. So again, what are the nine criteria that you need to meet? So you need to have the ability to undertake um, a DQRA. Again, understand the data that's required in order to do so. Be able to derive your site-specific assessment criteria. Um, be competent in the use of risk evaluation. And understand the limitations and the basic assumptions of the models that you are using. You need to have an awareness of uncertainty. Um, and, and how that affects your, your risk assessment, as well as the impact of time. You know, what is, what, what's the impact of time on the contamination in terms of its transportation, degradation, fate, etc.? You need to have an understanding of the legal, technical, social and environmental as aspects of your risk assessment and the legislative regime within, you, you know, within which you are working. Are you familiar with Part 2 way and planning and, and how they are different? Um, so I'll, I'll briefly just touch on the application requirements. Um, you'll find a lot of similarities with um, the Geological Society application that Alex spoke about earlier today. Again, you need an application form and fee, proof of your professional membership, uh, proof of chartership or that um, significant experience. I think there's a star there because we have a special form that you can fill in for that. You need to provide a CV, your professional report, CPD, your uh, referee statement, and we also insist on an interview. Um, people have always asked, oh, can I do that over Skype or WebEx, etc." The answer for that is no. To be fair to everyone, it always has to be done in person. It's a much better way to assess someone when, you, when you're face-to-face -face and you can ask those questions. Um, I'll briefly touch on these, um, but you'll find a, a lot in common with what was spoken about earlier. So when it comes to filling in your application, decide which practice areas you'd like to focus on. Um, you may be a regulator within a local authority and feel that oh, you, you know about human health and gas, the others not so much. Um, you're not obliged to, to apply for two practice areas. You, you, you can apply for one. Um, if you're a regulator within the environment agency, you may be more confident in your controlled waters aspect and you want to apply for that. Uh, you may be a consultant that you know, could be a range of things. You may be a specialist in gas and vapour, for example. And decide on which tier you'd like to apply at. Um, there's a little sign at the bottom saying, be honest and do not oversell yourself. Uh, we've seen examples where people, um, they, they take a punt and try to go for the A sober, try and go you know, for the, the, the highest level. Um, I'd say be honest, speak to your colleagues, make sure that you can actually meet all of the competency areas. If you're going for A, you also have to meet everything for R, so that's 18 criteria that you need to meet. And if you don't, it'll be quite obvious to the scrutineers um, that, that you, you, you haven't met that. In terms of your CV, make sure that that's tailored for the work that you've done on risk assessment. Your experience of working at McDonald's or singing at Butlins and things like that, not really relevant to risk assessment. Um, so just make sure that you tailor that towards um, the risk assessment part of your career. Similarly, when it comes to CPD, uh, Similarly to what Alex said earlier, people tend to struggle with CPD. They go, oh, my work doesn't allow me to go to conferences. I don't get sent on training, so I haven't got any CPD. If you've done research into a contaminant, if you've um, read up on some guidance, that all counts as CPD. If you've shadowed somebody on site because you want to see how they've drilled down into the chalk aquifer or something like that, that's, that's CPD. If you mentored or if you're mentoring someone, you, you, you can include that. So, yes, go through your Outlook calendar, have a look at everything that you've done in your diary, pull that out, and, and just 
um, you know, tailor that and, and explain how that links to the risk assessment element of your work. Um, the most important aspect of your application is your professional report. It's limited to two and a half thousand words. So use that opportunity to really hone in on the risk assessment aspects. Don't waffle on about, oh, I dug a trial pit and I put the soil arisings on a plastic sheet so that I didn't spread the contamination. Really interesting, not really relevant to what you've done in risk assessment. And don't say things like, I was part of a team that investigated an old gas works and we wrote a report. Well, what did you do as part of that? We, we're not interested in what the company did. We want to know what you did specifically. So be, so be clear on that. Um, referee statements. In our professional report, every bit that you've done needs to be signed off by someone. So if you said, yes, I've written more than 20 death studies, then a previous line manager needs to sign that off to say, yes, Chris has actually done 20 death studies. Now, this can be quite challenging if your career has, has gone over several employers, so you need to take enough time to make sure that you can track down old employers to make sure that they can sign that off. Um, and they'd also have to sign a declaration saying that, yes, they know you, they've worked with you, and everything you've said within your, your um, professional statement is, is true as far as they can vouch for. As I said, we have that interview in, in, in person. We've decided in Birmingham um, as a location that's fair to everyone. We have applicants coming from Devon and Cornwall, Kent, East Anglia, Scotland, all around the country. So having that central location we thought was the fairest for, for everyone. Um, the scrutineers need to confirm that it's actually you in person and you didn't get your mate to fill in your, your form for you. And they would fill in any gaps that they have after reading your professional report. You may find that you've applied for a SOBRA, but you've been invited for an R SOBRA based on the strength of your professional report. You may find that you've applied for A, been invited to interview for A, but may only achieve R. Um, all that will be explained um, in, in the feedback that we give um, following your assessment. Um, so how do you apply? We have two applications a year. Um, the, uh, the January one closes tomorrow, so if you're thinking about it, you better rush out of here at lunchtime and, 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 and get that done. But don't worry, we normally have another window in, in August. Um, all our documentation is on our sober website, so you can download the application pack and read our framework documents and everything anytime you like. Um, application fees are £175 to apply, and annual membership is, is £50. So is the whole process scary? No, not at all. If, if you are quite methodical, you go through the entire process, make sure that you provide evidence for all of those competencies, it's quite straightforward. Everyone's nervous at, at, at interviews. Don't worry, we don't bite. Our scrutineers are really friendly. They're not there to trick you or trap you and catch you out. They, they'll try and get the words out of you. If, 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 if they know that's at the tip of your tongue, they'll try and get it out of you. Um, and also, if you need some advice, if you're in a small company that you, you're not quite sure if you meet the, the competencies, send an email through to that email address. We do have some mentors that can speak to you, review the, your, your application and give you some advice or areas that you can work on before making your, your application. So lastly, I'd just like to say, you know, it's, it's a great scheme. I've been with Sobra for 10 years now. It's a great society. It's, um, it's, it's a friendly group of people that are trying to do their best for, for risk assessment within the, society, within the sector. And it's a great opportunity for you to actually contribute. So I'd encourage everyone in this room, if, you, if you're not a Sobra member already, come and join us. And, and uh, I really just, as, just to emphasize what Hugh was saying earlier, we need to demonstrate that we are competent within the sector, raise the bar, raise the standards. And one of the best ways of doing that is through the NQMS and through the SOBRA scheme. Thank you very much. Has anyone got any questions for Chris or Hugh? Ali Thomas, Environment Agency. I've got a question for Hugh, please. As uh, for being an SQP, you're, you're an SQP in, in, uh, as an individual, not as a company. Does that mean that should something go wrong, 
you have no access to your company's insurance. So who holds the liability? No, good question. Um, on the bottom of the declaration, it clearly states that the responsibility for the reports rests with the company who produced the reports. It does not rest with a suitably qualified person. So the suitably qualified person is signing off that declaration, but the liability is the same normal um, liabilities that we all have. So you are not personally liable um, under those circumstances, no. Any other questions? How many people are silks or sober, a sobers? How many people are chartered? Okay, so the, char so the people who aren't chartered, first step, become chartered. Second step, definitely become silk, sober, depending on your expertise, because that's the way that we will move things forward. I know it's more difficult for local authority officers and environment agency people because we all get paid to be members, our, com our companies pay us, but um, most of the schemes have reduced fees for um, local authority people, and I... I think if enough people complained about that, then surely it would be a right thing to do for people. How many people are there who would actually take that money from a local authority coffer? It's a small sum. It should happen. But from a personal point of view, I'd really encourage you all to think about becoming chartered. Um, it puts you in a very strong position then when you're arguing with consultants who are producing substandard reports if you are chartered and, and perhaps they're not. Thank you very much. Okay.